Okay, so just everybody uh, is aware we are recording this just uh, so we can post it on the Maine Humanities website. But I'm gonna. My name is Jim Saint Pierre. I am one of the um, the Humanities Teacher Leader Fellows for the State of Maine for the year of 2023 and 24. This is our actually our last professional development um, as uh, teacher leaders this year. So hopefully some of you may apply for the position if they open back up. It's been a real pleasure to work with everybody. But I'm gonna leave this to um, Jess and Dory, right? Hi, yeah, so I'm Dory Tripp. So I'm also a teacher leader fellows for fellow for the humanities. Um, and we also have Jessica Graham with us today. Um, she's a teacher leader fellow for civics. And we've de decided to join forces today to talk about field trip planning, um, which might sound a little funny at being the end of the school year uh, for this year. But as we know, it does take some pre-planning and foresight. So hopefully um, what we're able to offer you today will help you um, with your planning for next year. Um, so without further ado, we'll get started. Um, today, we're going to spend some time talking about a few different things around field trips. Um, the planning piece, not assuming that everybody here is a teacher that has planned field trips before. Um, not everybody has experience in that. So we'll be discussing just a little bit about tips and tricks for the field trip planning process. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about funding. We've done a little bit of research on places that you can tap into to help your school with funding for transportation or admittance costs. Um, we're also going to share some ideas and inspiration on planning your trips, venues, or places to go to. And um, we hope that maybe um, if there are places that you've been that you suggest, uh, we would love to hear your input as well as we compile a list to share with Maine educators. And then finally, we will share a link to a very brief survey um, just to give us feedback on this session. And then um, when you submit that, um, I will receive your information and we'll be able to email you uh, a certificate to put toward recertification hours. So uh, to start with planning field trips, um, Jessica, you can go ahead into the next slide. So um, there are some pieces, if you've never planned a field trip before um, on your own, something, it, it, it can feel like a really big thing, especially going with large groups of kids outside of the school into the real world. Um, depending on your district and your business office, there may be some things to um, talk about and consider. So first, of course, um, choosing the destination that you would like to attend. Um, the first the first thing to consider maybe is the venue size and whether or not it can be accommodating for your group and the distance, how far you'll have to travel from school. I hey, Dory, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think Susan Daggett has a question. I do, I have a quick question, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm a new director, so I thought it'd be really nice to, to sit on this webinar. Um, one of my coordinators couldn't make it tonight. If she were to watch it on her own, um, could she still get that certification certificate? Um, yes. Yeah, so actually it'll be posted later through the DOE humanities website. And, okay. um, if she would like to receive the contact hours, it actually won't go through us. Um, it'll go through our, um, supervisor. Um, her name is Beth Lambert. And there is, there is a process, I think, listed on there. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, so, yes, yeah, so checking out the venue size and the distance from your school, those are definitely factors you want to consider. Um, the curricular connections to, you know, what you're doing in the classroom. I know a lot of teachers that sometimes, sometimes field trips are for enrichment and fun and enjoyment as well, but um, definitely picking a venue if, if, if if you would like to make a connection with what you're working on in your classroom, that's a consideration. Accessibility um, as well. And, you know, you gotta plan, pick a date and time and work that out to schedule that with the venue that you're working with. Um, also considering the age group, I teach elementary school. I'm a music teacher. I didn't um, share that in my introduction, but thinking about the age of your students and also the length of time that um, they might be able to physically or mentally 
be involved in this field trip. Those are all things to consider. Um, after that, funding. Um, sometimes schools have money allocated in their budget to put towards some of this field trip cost. I know here at my school, we have a really active parent teacher organization and they love funding field trips. Um, and so we present our ideas to them and a lot of times they are able to provide us with the funds we need to keep the cost for students um, very minimal, if not zero. We will also be sharing information about various grants that you can uh, tap into or apply for. That's something to consider. And then of course there are sometimes with, you know, we've exhausted everything else. We might have to ask students to contribute a couple bucks to attend. Um, those are all various options. Um, sometimes what isn't considered right away that does take some time um, is getting approval from administration. Business offices sometimes require you to fill out certain paperwork to the transportation department, to the, the school nutrition department, especially if lunches need to be provided, if you're having lunch at your venue. Um, and so that there is a little bit of a turnaround time as far as that goes. If you are taking long trips, sometimes the school board, depending on the policy of your school, sometimes the school board needs to approve that trip as well. Um, you definitely need to reach out to your school nurse um, for students with allergies or that need medications administered and time to send out permission slips to parents and have those returned. So as you can see, the planning process can take, you know, as several months if if necessary. Dory, is it okay if I chime in here? Absolutely, please do. Yeah, my so my one of my first years of teaching, I you know, very young and it was very loosey goosey sort of, isn't it? It was a long time ago. But I, um, I was supposed to get a sub. I had to, I had to worry about um, food because we have a boarding population where I work, um, even though it's a local high school as well. So I needed to get food for him, and I didn't know about any of that. So the day of the field trip, um, like it was, it was just crazy. So planning for it became a huge, um, a huge issue whenever I planned because I wanted to make sure all of my ducks in a, are in a row. And I know for my wife, um, she teaches at elementary and, and they have to have a CPR or a first aid certified person on the field trip with them. So sometimes you have to recruit other personnel into it um, as well. Yeah. And so you bring up a good point. It's definitely I reaching out to your administration with the idea for a field trip first might be a great idea um, so that they can point you into the direction of all the forms you need to fill out or the process that you need to go through. And um, I think most schools kind of require similar things, but because um, local control and policies, you definitely want to get to know your own school's policies around field trips. And I wanted to chime in really quickly as well um, regarding the school nurse. I know our school nurse is so great about being proactive. Um, and this past couple of years, I've had several students where in the process of planning a field trip, as long as you know, I'd give her a lot of heads up anyway. Um, but one thing that has been surprising and really helpful is that she has been super proactive with teachers about doing some little mini trainings uh, uh, for particular student needs. So just a refresher on administering EpiPins. Um, we have a couple of diabetic students at our school. So a mini training on how to um, help recognize signs of like low blood sugar. Uh, so reaching out with enough advance notice to your school nurse is helpful, not only to get kind of like your list of like, does anyone have health concerns? Um, but our school nurse has been excellent about making staff feel really comfortable in dealing with any issues that might come up that, um, you know, the the like sub calling 911 type of issues, uh, but any issues that might come up, we're having just a little bit of extra training or preparation before you take kids out. Um, it just makes everyone feel a lot more comfortable. So that's great to ask your school nurse if they're not someone who's who's used to like helping in that way for field trips, you could just ask them, um, do you, would you mind giving me a little refresher on like how to do an EpiPen or a little refresher on um, how to help kids that are diabetic or something like that. So I know our nurse is awesome about that. That's great. And all these things seem like a lot. Um, if it feels overwhelming, 
Uh, it always is great to plan a field trip with a team. So hopefully you're part of a team or a cohort that can kind of share some of these responsibilities and duties with you. Um, it's more fun for the students mm -hmm. and it's easier for us to manage as well. All right. I think I had um, added a couple of things to think about as you're prepping. Uh, I am a classroom teacher now. I teach social studies. I teach high school. Um, but in the past, in my past life, I actually planned uh, field trip and outreach programming for different museums. So I've seen both sides of it. And there's some really interesting research about how to maximize student learning from field trips. And I remember reading a study years ago that really hit home when I thought about um, how I can make this experience better for schools that were visiting my site at the time. And now as a teacher, how can I make sure that I'm preparing students so they're getting the most out of it. And one of the most surprising facts to me from this research was, and it shouldn't have been surprising because you think about hierarchy of needs, but students are going to have um, a much better time, more enjoyable time, but also retain more information if they know how to deal with their basic needs when they're at a site. So if you are in any way able to like visit a site yourself or make sure you ask questions about um, what's the bathroom situation? How, where are we gonna eat? Where could kids get water? Um, are there areas that might need a little more supervision? I have found that if you can address with your students, if you can address those needs right off the bat, like just let everyone know, if you need to go to the bathroom, this is where the bathrooms are. This is what our procedure is gonna be. This is where you're gonna have food and water um, and how you can access that. That stuff, it sounds so simple, but a lot of times we're so excited about the trip that we forget to talk about those basics. And then kids spend half the morning worried about like, oh my gosh, when are we going to be able to eat? I have to go to the bathroom. How do I know where to do that? Um, so dealing with those things. And if you can visit beforehand and see for yourself, it's great. And then thinking about um, what pre-teaching as you're planning what pre-teaching might need to happen in the classroom in terms of both content, but also just the life skill stuff that is so great about field trips. Um, what, what would be helpful for you to deal with days or even like in the weeks prior to a trip so that when they get there, you've already done a lot of that work. And it's just a, remember we talked about X, Y, and Z. All right, so let's talk a little bit about funding. Money is always kind of <laughs> the elephant in the room that sometimes can pre prevent us from taking on exciting adventures with our kids. Um, so, oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, all right, so there are a couple of places that you can look for. Of course, we talked about locally, um, if like your school has a PTO or in your building, there's um, some discretionary funding that your principal can use to help take kids places. Um, that might be a place you look at first. Otherwise, um, I will speak to some of the arts-based um, venues that if you are taking students to a performance or to a museum, there are um, some funds out there that are specifically for that, um, the Maine Arts Commission offers grants of um, a couple hundred dollars, I believe, um, to, hel uh, to help you get to these venues. So they offer the Ticket to Ride program. There is a link um, on their website, which I will upload into this presentation. Um, when you go check it out later, you can click on that. Um, there is there's an application really easy to fill right out and their purpose is to help pay for transportation um, to arts venues. Another one is Destination Portland. If you're interested in bringing kids to um, like the Merrill Auditorium for a performance or to see the Portland Symphony Orchestra, there are um, again, grants to help with transportation itself. So it doesn't necessarily help you with admittance cost, but we know busing is very expensive, especially if you are traveling a farther distance than just kind of locally. If, if you're living outside of Portland, that might be something for you to tap into. Oh, um, actually- I'm sorry. Like <laughs> Sorry. So I think, um, Jess, did you put in tar um, No, that was, oh, that was Jim. me. Okay. 
that's very quick. My my both my boys had a great field trips to the um, to the the, um, the Plymouth Plantation down in, in the Salem area, and uh, both times the school applied for a target grant and got it. And it's it's uh, I think close to a thousand dollars, and that pays it offsets quite a bit of the of the cost of the at least the busing. That was the biggest price. Mm -hmm. um, but that's one way to sort of cobble together. But it takes planning and it takes um, making sure that uh, you have your, you know, all of the forms you need submitted at the right time. But um, there are there are mm -hmm. uh, resources. And I also put about local businesses because we've had some that have wanted kids to come to their place so they can show off and they will pay for the busing. Mm -hmm. um, and so if it works into a unit, it can be beneficial. Absolutely. There's some other ones as well that we've shared in our newsletters that we'll compile as well um, that are specifically for um, smaller rural schools or schools that maybe have 50% or more um, of students accessing free and reduced lunch and things like that. Um, so there are there are grants out there. Some museums um, offer grants as well. So we'll we'll continue to touch upon those as we go through our presentation. Um, and I had just added, uh, reinforcing what Dory said, it really comes down to being willing to ask. Um, ask anyone you can think of. Uh, I have only once ever asked students to contribute money for a trip. I've been able, I've been really blessed at having businesses, the district, different organizations fund all sorts of local travel. But even this is a picture of me with some of my kids that uh, we took to DC and it was a really, really low cost for students because I went through the very uncomfortable process of asking uh, for money, something I don't love to do, but that I've learned there are so many people and organizations out there that are excited to give you funds to take your kids out into the world. Like they love to do it. Um, so again, internal grants from any organization that you're considering traveling to. I'm here in Waterville, the Colby Art Museum. Um, they they do a lot for us as our local, you know, we're their host city. So they do a lot for us, but even other schools up to, I think, an hour away, historically, they have um, not only provided free programming, but they will help offset transportation costs and they will offer student lunch in the dining hall, which is a really fun life experience for a lot of our kids. Um, so ask the organization if they have any discounts, if they have any grants available. Smaller organizations might not, but larger well-funded organizations really often do have something available. Um, principal discretionary funds, that's not going to that's not going to cost a uh, pay for a trip to DC, but often a uh, building administrator has something set aside. And if you ask and they haven't made plans for it, like you might end up being the recipient of those discretionary funds. So that's happened for me a few times where it was towards the end of the year, like May, and uh, I wanted to take kids somewhere and asked the principal, is there any money left? Is there anything that we could do to cover the cost and have often had a yes as an answer? Um, and then of course, uh, like Jim was saying, local businesses um, at my previous school, we had some pretty significant field trip uh, expenditures that were offset by um, local businesses either providing grants or in some cases, like we made t-shirts for the trip and they had their advertising on the back. Uh, so lots of different ways to engage your community. And then often we try to... I not to add another layer of like planning and thinking, but we really try to, at the high school, if there's a business that's been generous, we try to think about, um, are there ways that we can return the favor on our day of service? Like, can we rake your leaves for you or like mulch your flower beds or do something to show our gratitude to those businesses that support us in those endeavors? Definitely. Um, one more thing too, I just, um, at our school, that I'm at, we do have a lot of very generous parents too. So if there is a low cost, like, you know, each student brings in $5 and there you are worried about students that um, $5 would be a lot to ask. There are parents all the time that would love to send in extra money to cover a student or two as well. So um, the generosity of our community um, definitely can always be tapped. 
So let's transition now to talk about some ideas of places in Maine that you can bring your kids. Um, and I think I will start. Um, so again, because I am a music teacher, the visual and performing arts venues are kind of high up on, on my list. However, you don't have to be a music or an art teacher to bring your students to any of these venues. Arts integration is just so important um, for all of our kids. And sometimes it is some very memorable experiences occur um, at these places their students will love. So um, for our young population, the Children's Museum and Theater um, in Portland is a wonderful venue to visit. It is very play-based learning. Um, and I know a lot of elementary school teachers will already know this, but um, what you may not know is they also do performances there as well, which is really great. And they're all very kid friendly and interactive. And you could spend a whole day in this venue with your kids. You go do some educational things, some playtime, some lunch, and it is a fabulous place. Um, it's even different. I mean, they've built this new facility in the last um, several years and it's just remarkable. Um, also, Portland Ovations um, offers, uh, through their website, you can check out. Right now, there is really nothing on the calendar yet, but next school year, there will be. They offer school time concerts or school time performances where they can show, um, you know, very kid-friendly musicals, plays, and whatnot, um, and it's a great place to bring your students. Um and again, through the Portland Ovations website, you can also find information on funding um, and get to their um, Destination Portland application. Um, the Portland Symphony Orchestra and the Bangor Symphony Orchestra, if you're more north, um, they offer some really great outreach programs for our youth as well with um, educational concerts or um, great themed concerts that kids would be really excited about. They've done things around Christmas time or um, Harry Potter music or music from, from movies. Um, Portland Symphony Orchestra also does kinder concerts, which is very interactive for our youngest students as well. Um, and a lot of times they will all also um, offer like instrument type, like petting zoos, learning about the instruments and the um, sections of the orchestra, or even just about the science of sound in general. They offer a lot of great stuff for kids. And again, there are, um, if you're kind of far out from Bangor or Portland, there are grants to help transport your kids there for performances. Um, and then last but not least, um, this website is super helpful. I don't, maybe you want to click on that for me, Jessica, the main art um, museum trail should be right there. Yeah. So this website is fabulous. It offers some great suggestions on local art museums sprinkled throughout the state in Bar Harbor, in Southern Maine, in Central Maine, Western Maine. It's wonderful. Um, and if you scroll down a little bit, um, they, they offer in these nine museums, you can click on, um, an icon and it'll tell you a little bit about the museum, what kind of exhibits you can expect um, or how to plan your trip, who to contact. Um, and it is a great place to start mm -hmm. if you're looking um, at planning a trip to a local museum. Also, a lot of these places have really great scenic areas where you can um, spend some time like outside or explore some other areas as well if you would like to extend your trip get the most out of it that you can um, I know my son just this week with his um, middle school the sixth grade class they went to the Colby Art Museum and they had a great time over there um, they did some work on like basket weaving and things and he just had so much to share when he got home from school it was lovely to see so these are all really great educational um places to visit. And I actually, my, we're in, we're near Colby, but I just brought my students to the Bowdoin College Museum oh. of Art um, last week. And it was an absolute delight. The campus is beautiful. So the art museum was incredible, but then we got to walk around campus. It was a nice day and it happened to be, uh, it was a smaller group of high school students. So there's a little 
flexibility that might not exist if you have a large group of elementary school students, um, but it was the day of the Brunswick Farmers Market. So we changed our lunch plans and we all went to the farmer's market and ate outside. It was just a beautiful day. And I just wanted to highlight, um, I'm glad that this website brings all of these museums together because what you might notice is that so many of our um, art museums in Maine, especially our college art museums have free admission, free admission for everyone all the time, um, even if you're bringing a school group. And boy, does that cut down on the cost of your trip if the admission to the museum is free. Wonderful. And I will just piggyback on that too. When I asked my son about his trip. He loved it. He had so much to share, but funny enough, it's on a college campus. Hit like The biggest excitement for him was being able to eat <laughs> on campus and in the cafeteria and having those choices <laughs> as well. So you can definitely get middle school um, kids excited, high school kids, I'm sure too, with the lunch options. And Colby, I think, does the meal for free, I'm pretty sure. So it's a really generous, um, generous thing. And you're right, like that's always our students. That's always their favorite part is the dining hall lunch. <laughs> um, um, I can added I just add one thing to that. I'm sorry is that um, we have uh, some theater, I teach at a high school as well, and but I think appropriate for middle, the Portland Stage Company has quite a few options yeah. for working with, uh, they love to work with high schools. And even if you're not uh, teaching theater, like we teach, um, we, I'm sorry, I taught Shakespeare. Uh, we teach Shakespeare at my school. And um, so they'll ha often have a Shakespeare show and, and give discounted tickets and, and they might even help with transportation. Um, I've added a few more things to think about. I mean, I could go on and on. Maine is just what what an amazing um, bounty of riches for educational opportunities. Uh, Historic New England is uh, one of the many organizations that cares for some of our historic properties in the state. Uh, they have six historic houses. They do a lot of programming more geared for elementary and some middle school uh, but the programming is, it touches on um, history content, uh, natural, the natural world, so science stuff, but also a lot of connections with um, art and literature. I know that they care for the Sarah Orne Jewett house. So there's a lot that you could find for the historic, through the Historic New England website, and they are across a lot of the states. So they have some properties in as far south as York, South Berwick, but also up in Wiscasset, et cetera. Um, that's a place I've taken students. The Maine Historical Society is fantastic. Again, they have um, definitely a lot of programming around Maine history, but they have interdisciplinary stuff for sure. Their current exhibit is about music in Maine. Um, and they are they are such experts in doing field trips. They've been doing it for decades and they're great at it. Um, sometimes I think you can get funding or have been able to in the past. I'm not sure what their current situation is, but a great organization to look for. Um, another thing I put up here, this is actually a picture of uh, one of my students and my daughter at the Common Ground Fair. Uh, there are lots of fairs in Maine early in the school year, and they can be a really great field trip, especially if there's one close by. This fair is close to our school, and we took a combined group, uh, myself and some other teachers, a combined group of music students who performed at the fair, and history students who had a scavenger hunt exploring different um, agricultural methods that maybe are rooted more in our agricultural tradition in the state. And they also explored some information about um, Wabanaki culture. So the fair was close by. It was a pretty great deal for um, bringing all of our kids up. The bus ride wasn't long and it was a gorgeous day, really memorable, lots of unexpected curricular connections. Um, there are also tons of lesser known local attractions. I've thrown up just a couple that I've either taken students to or went to as a student myself years ago. Um, we have a lot of tiny museums, a lot of little historic sites. The top picture on um, the upper right corner is the Elsie Bates Museum, which is up in 
Hinkley near Fairfield. And it's a really old, very small natural history museum, but they do a lot of really lovely programming for elementary and middle school students. Um, at the bottom is the Old Red Church in Standish. We are a state full of historic sites, historic buildings, um, often with smaller sites, or if you did something like a fair, the plus side is that it's probably going to be a lower cost trip for you. Um, the, the part that is maybe more work is that you might have to really design what that experience is going to be for your students. So I, rather than going to a site where there's established, um, educational programming like Historic New England or the Maine Historical Society, where they have professionals who are designing those experiences for your students. You can go and chaperone, but really there will be staff there leading them through that. If you take advantage of some of these other opportunities, um, that does require a little more legwork to design the experience for your kids. So I designed the experience for my history kids at the Common Ground Fair, um, when we go to local historic sites, I often, there's not really staff, there are some volunteers usually, uh, but I'll design an experience for those kids. Um, the plus side of going to local attractions is that there's not a lot of um, transportation cost, and also you often can do it in a pretty minimal amount of time in the school day. It doesn't ne necessarily necessitate disrupting an entire school day, which can be great for administration um, if they're trying to squeeze in a lot of activities. Oh, Jessica, can I ask a question? Oh, uh, sure. I'm so sorry. Yes, yes of course. Hi. Um, so um, I'm going to teach French next year, and I'm wondering if um, Historic New England and Maine Historical Society have, uh, have you know, some uh, maybe information about uh, French communities in Maine? That's a wonderful question. So historic New England, as far as I know, their, their sites that they manage in Maine, not most of them are related to colonial or early Republic era sites. And it's very like Anglo-American focused. However, they are a regional organization that has a pretty rich archive, and they may have archival um, items related to the Franco-American communities in Maine. Um, Maine Historical Society, they might not have a lot on site right now. None of their exhibits right now are related to Franco-American culture, but they they absolutely have a lot of artifacts related to that. And they actually have a website called Maine memory.net and you can look up artifacts um and they'll have photographs they'll have objects and you can it's not exactly a field trip but you could do certainly a lot of um interesting projects with students built around um artifacts and objects from Maine's Franco-American communities some other places you might want to think about contacting I'm not sure what they do for educational outreach but the um there's a Franco-American archives at the university, uh, a university of Southern Maine, but it's in Lewiston, like the campus that's in Lewiston. There's an archives there and I think an exhibit space as well. Um, and they may, they may offer educational programming. That's actually something I should look into too. Um, and I'm trying to think what else, uh, um, Jess, I, my son goes to the University of Maine or Orno. I believe they have a Franco-American um, chapter do. up there. They do. You're right. Yep. So up at Orno as well. And um, I think in Lewiston, they have an exhibit space. I'm not sure about in Orno. Uh, I shouldn't, I feel like I should know that, but I'm not sure. But Thank there are, so, there are some places, I think um, another resource to check out related to Franco-American culture and history. I know in Waterville and I think also in Lewiston, I'm trying to think where they're located. There are a few towns in Maine that have something called Museum in the Streets. I actually was going to talk about it um, coming up. And this is an organization where um, local citizens partner with this, this organization and they create historic plaques and markers and then they put them in sites around the city and create a little walking tour, a self-guided walking tour. And I know ours in Waterville focuses on Franco-American history. And I think there are some others around the state that do as well. 
Um, and that's one of those types of field trips that you can get kids out and walking around and, um, you might have to do a little more of the organizing. There's not going to be a staff person that can take on that, that task, but there's definitely, there's definitely stuff out there. Um, and actually your question makes me really want to try to see what I can do next year. Cause that's definitely an under, under realized potential, um, for me for sure. Thank you. You're welcome. And I think here, um, the Maine Humanities website uh, has a lot of resources. If you want to check out their, their website, there are some other things that you can um, take a look at. Jess, can you click on that for me? Yeah. Um, so uh, some of our, um, as a, a good portion of our early in, early in September, I think, um, might have been in, in about this time last year. Dory and I did a lot of a series of newsletters on um, bringing art into the classroom, and a lot of that had to do with the different um, museums and state. We're really rich with uh, with museums, and so this gives you a list of them. And they encourage. I went to a, a a Zoom sort of webinar with a lot of the people working for the museums, and they said, "Contact, contact the museum. They have personnel that are trained to work with students and to create outreach, and they can actually." Um, if you're studying something, they can um, organize an event or content around what you're doing, and they might even be able to guide you to a place where you can apply for funds for for, for participation and travel. So. And I, I actually, again, my first, my former career, I worked for 10 years in museum education, and um, a big part of my responsibility was outreach to schools. And I was a paid educator. I had, unlike classroom teachers, I had all the time in the world to develop curriculum, to put together lessons, to put together um, curriculum that would really be tailored to the needs of a particular school or a teacher. And I think people didn't realize that because classroom teaching is so different and you have so many demands on your time. But there are people who want to do this work with you and for you. So definitely ask the museum if they have education staff that might work with you. I know I used to spend so many days on the phone, like trying to find people who wanted to use my time. Like I want to help design this program for you and I want to tailor it to your needs. Um, so yeah, the places that have education staff, a lot of the smaller museums won't, but um, some of the more established or larger organizations, they have people who want to help work with you to make it a great experience and a meaningful experience for your kids. And they're trained educators, they're experts in their field, and they are happy and excited to um, work with you. So that's that's great advice. I, I feel like I used to basically be cold calling, like, please let me design stuff for you. I want your kids to have a great experience. All right. Um, other places, James, did you want to talk a little bit about? Yeah, I, I posted a lot of these. We, uh, you know, I live in Freiburg, so I just wanted to say that the Freiburg Fair, every, everybody goes on a field trip to the Freiburg Fair and they find some way to interact. And the, and the fair is good about giving everybody free entry. And so it's, um, and they have foot photography uh, uh, exhibits that the students participate in. So it's it's pretty amazing. Uh, we also have a, a huge number of small cemeteries and there's one right in the middle of town and probably many of your towns has them as well. And um, it, it in the, you know, they go back hundreds of years and um, you can use them at all ages as, uh, you know, if you do research on your town, but we happened to do it with um, a, a meaning of life unit. And so we went there and, and looked around. And so interestingly enough about the cemetery right in the middle of Freiburg is um, a, a grave set aside and it's the grave of Limbo. And he was one of the first residents of Freiburg. He also happened to be a man who was enslaved. And so um, a lot of, um, a, a, a a lot of studies about him and early uh, life in Maine um, revolve around the study uh, of what it was like for a slave, for a man who was enslaved in this area at that time. And so there's uh, the main, it's very often you might need to explore on your own through your local historical society, but there is an old cemetery, Maine Old Cemetery Association that is, is continually updating registries of old cemeteries and uh, in many cases who is, um, whose remains reside there. Mm -hmm. um, farms my wife in particular uh, 
uh, works who works at elementary school takes a lot of field trips to farms and um, and you know, when they're learning about nature and um, there's other areas like Tin Mountain in our area, which is a nature organization. So they'll go there and they'll do tours of that area and learn about different aspects of nature. But there's a couple of great spots. One's the Remicke Museum, um, Museum in Tamworth, which is for us right over the border. It is in New Hampshire. But there's another one called the Washburn Norlands. And those are old farms from the early 1800s that are still being used in their original way. Can you um, can you pick on the Washburn Norlands? Sure. So I, I love this one because uh, there's a picture of a young girl who's walking in a traditional um, outfit up to the estate, and so they like to bring students there. They like to um, they like to show off and and show the different skills that people needed in that time period. So the students actually learn quite a lot just interacting with the environment. And, uh, and they have an, it's a working farm, working um, you know they have animals and and uh, you know they they learn how to make soap and candles and it's it's a lot of interesting content. And um, I'm wondering if any of you have local ideas as well for uh, in, in your areas. And just jumping in with a couple other things to think about. Um, we, you know, we are in Waterville are super lucky. We have an art center that does a lot of educational programming, but also has a program to pay for admission for students to concerts, to plays, et cetera. Um, again, Maine is a really a state rich with arts organizations and museums. I put a picture here of one of Augusta's sturgeon. So um, Augusta has one of those historic walking trails, but alongside that, they also have this really cool public art installation where different artists from around the state have submitted um, decorated sturgeon, which are so fun to look at and think about. Uh, so if you in your town have some sort of public art or um, a historic walking trail, that can be a great like half day field trip experience for your kids who maybe don't even know all of the cool things about their own community that they live in. And lastly, for a local, um, a local field trip that I always find really meaningful as someone who cares deeply about civics, I, every school I've ever taught in, um, whatever community I've taught in, I have taken my students to the local city hall for a field trip. And we do like a basic tour, what sort of things happen at city hall. I have high school students. So often I have students who end up registering to vote while they're there. Um, I even had, uh, I once was doing a field trip during absentee voting for a June election. And I had a student who raised their hand and asked the city clerk if they could fill out an absentee ballot. And so I got to see them vote for their very first time. And we all like cheered when they were done. It was really, really awesome. Um, and kids have always, even years later, I have kids now that have graduated from college who have said, I'm so glad you took us on that field trip. I feel like I knew how to do adulting because we went on this field trip to our local city hall. So that was in each of those cases, it was like a one block field trip. We didn't have to miss any time other than our own class time together. Um, and it was really, really valuable. So there's stuff around you that it's worth taking kids out to. And even if we take it for granted, um, or we think it's pretty simple, it can mean a lot to, if it's something that kids do together as a class. Yeah, I put these in actually, because I was still researching. And so I didn't know where to exactly put, put these in. But the, somebody um, from the state had sent me a link to the Gulf of Maine Research Institute lab venture field trip for opportunity for fifth and sixth graders. And um, this is a grant and it's like free to go there, it provides transportation and then it, it is a full day um, curriculum regarding all of the research that's going on and what's going on with the Gulf of Maine. So particularly for science teachers, that's a, that could be a, a really meaningful field trip. And then, um, you know, we're, we're, I'm, I'm so thankful for uh, Governor um, Mills' support of education in the state of Maine. And so part of what she's done is create this outdoor learning initiatives programs, and that helps students get outdoors and experience them in meaningful ways. And um, a lot of them are free, and there's like tons of them listed. And I think there's more coming all the time. It's mostly for middle school and high school students across the state, but um, there's a lot of different things they can do outside. And I'm sure you can work it into just about any kind of um, uh, curriculum that you're trying to work with because there's just so many programs. And 
And did Dory put the survey in the? Um... She did. Yeah, there's a link Perfect. in there. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so that's the end of what uh, Jess and I have, right? If any of you have any ideas or suggestions, we'd we'd love to hear from them. I'm going to add some links onto this, and then this is uh, going to be posted probably on the Humanities and the Civics newsletters, and uh, so you can visit it and you get the resources, and we'll put the recording on there as well. But if you want uh, credit hour credit for the contact hours, there's a survey that's on in the link, so you want to be sure to get that, and that that link will be here as well. So if you if you get the newsletters, you can just open up the document and uh, click on it there as well. I am going to end the recording here.